Good morning. morning. Okay, as Ben just reminded us, we're going to be in 2 Peter this morning. So you can turn there. We just finished 1 Peter, so it's right next door. So it's not a big deal to find. Uh, Right there, we'll start in in just a moment. But I just wanted to take a moment, really, as a church family, and and pause and recognize uh, I, I've never sang that song before we just sang, but that is a wonderful song. Uh, the idea that Christ can be magnified through our lives is the idea that we've been talking about as we went all the way through First Peter. It's this idea that no matter what comes to us in life, whether it's trials, joys, good times, hard times, wonderful experiences, and things that we would rather not be part of, whatever comes into our lives, we have the opportunity to allow the Lord to be magnified through us. That is an amazing truth because that doesn't change no matter where you are in life. No matter how old or young you are, no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus or if you're very new to walking with Christ or no matter if you've been through difficult times or your life has been amazingly blessed in a different way, no matter where you are in life, that holds true. Christ is, can be magnified through you. And as we look at 2 Peter, we start to walk our way through a a second letter that Peter writes is generally to the same folks. That is the same focus that we're looking at as we move into this next letter. 2 Peter predominantly focuses on this idea of knowing God. And when it is that you know God well, when you have immersed yourself in understanding who he is and what he's done for you, you can then see the world clearly. And that is one of the biggest things I'd like us to take a moment and just kind of focus on as we get in today into a new study in 2 Peter is this, without knowing who God is and what he has created you for, you don't truly see the world clearly. Everything is shaded and broken and deceitful and disappointing without knowing who God is, how good he is, how gracious he is, how merciful he's been. Yes, we live in a broken world that shows us lots of other things. But as we just sang, even death doesn't separate us from who God is and what he's done for us. That, that truth has to be something that gets really deep into our hearts, more than just me saying it up here on a Sunday morning. That truth is something that we have to, as people who want to follow Christ and want to be part of his church family and grow in him, we have to allow that to sink deep into who we are. He is a good God, and he can be magnified in every situation that we deal with. So coming from this first letter from 1 Peter that he was generally talking about suffering and what was to come for the people that he was writing to, the exiles, he was giving them hope in the midst of everything. Now we get into this second letter and I'm gonna give you just a little bit of background before we dig into the text this morning in First Peter chapter, or in 2 Peter chapter one. We're gonna look at the first three verses, but Whenever you go into something, I always want to make sure I know where we're coming from. What is the context of this letter? Who was writing? Who's he writing to? Where is it going? And what is the time frame in which he's writing? What's going on that Peter's trying to address here? This epistle, this letter was written after 1 Peter, obviously, but generally it is one of the last books, timeline-wise, that's written as part of our New Testament. It's very much towards the end. It's, very, it's probably written somewhere between 63 and 66 AD, somewhere in that neighborhood. How do we know that? We know that because Peter refers to the fact that he knows he's going to die soon. Right in this later in the first chapter. We know generally when Peter was killed, and we know then when he kind of wrote this letter. So he writes this at the same time that Nero burned Rome in 64 AD. Nero is an emperor in the Roman Empire. He's probably the worst combatant against Christians that you can really read about in history. Peter, God gave Peter the foreknowledge to know that Nero was going to do what he was going to do to Christians when he wrote the first letter and he was preparing people's hearts for hard times. 
And when we think about that first letter and God preparing the people's hearts, the exiles that were there, giving them hope and preparing them for hard times, one of the things we have to stop and realize is that's part of God's character and nature. The fact that he would care enough to get his people ready for what was coming and allow them to have something to stand on solid ground going into those trials, that is a reflection of how gracious he is. He knew what was coming. God knows all things. It's not a surprise to him. And he wants his people to go well through anything that comes. Second Peter, likewise, is something that God has prepared and cared and given us so that we can be prepared for what may come. Now, differently, this book is focused upon knowing God and particularly knowing God in reference to knowing what false teaching looks like and not being led astray. So that's what this letter is on. These three chapters that Peter gives us, they're different than the first letter. The first letter with its five chapters were really uh, generally an encouragement to know that difficult things happen in life and you can know how to live for God in the midst of them. This second letter is mostly written towards the idea of protection. Protection against false teachings. And This is the first century, we got to remember. This is very closely related to when Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, and there were already false teachers trying to lead Christians astray. And that hasn't changed. We're a couple thousand years later, and there are people all over the place that will name the name of Christ, but teach things opposite to what we know about him. And it's important for the people of God to know who God is, what he has told us, and how we should live in light of it so that when others do come in with some false teaching, some things that are just a little bit off, but lead you a long way off, Christians should be able to stop and identify, no, that's not true. That's not what God said. What does that require of us? particularly as we look at this book talking about false teaching and identifying false teaching and staying away from it. We have to know God. That is our theme for this next series. We have to know who he is. We won't know if things are opposite to his teaching if we don't know what he's taught us. We have to know the story of how God has created, sustained, redeemed, and will one day restore all of creation. If we don't know the God of the Bible, we won't know when somebody says something that's different than what he would say. So as I was reading commentaries and thinking through different things, many folks do label this entire book that is focused on false teaching and heretical teaching, but I I wanted us to take a slightly different approach to it because I think the idea is not generally focused around false teaching. It's focused around the God who has saved them and saved us. And if we focus on that, we will know the counterfeits. So let's dig in a little bit. First Peter cha- or Second Peter chapter one. I'm going to say First Peter a lot because I'm just stuck in that. There were so many sermons we did, but this is Second Peter. So we're in Second Peter chapter one. I'm going to read for us the first three verses. Then we're going to dive in and, and see what God has for us this morning. It says Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That verse three uh, of this first chapter is one of my favorite verses It's one of my favorite verses for myself. It's also one of my favorite verses to talk with others about. Why? Because it is a complete promise from God. He says, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're going to start here in verse three. It says, he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is a truth 
that as believers, we need to grab a hold of every day. Because honestly, there's a lot of days where you probably wake up and think, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to do the next thing. I don't know how to stay true to what God's called me to do. There's so many other forces coming into my life, pushing me in a different direction. I don't think I can do it. And too often I talk with Christians who live in defeat. And that's not where God's put us. He's put us in victory. He says here, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. That's it. The whole bundle comes to us in Jesus. And what God's done for us through him changes everything about who we are and about how we're supposed to live. All right, back up to verse one with me. So as we start in, it's obvious that Simon Peter's writing this because he names himself, but he calls himself by a couple of particular statements here in verse one. He says, Simon, Simeon Peter, Simeon's just the, the Hebrew name for Simon, says, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. It's interesting here that Peter starts in with being a servant. If we know Peter's history, that's not always how we perceive him, right? I think if I was going to describe Peter, I'd probably describe him as a fighter, as a vocal voice piece for the apostles, for the disciples there in the first century. There's lots of ways I would describe Peter that, that aren't necessarily starting with servant. But here's why I believe Peter uses this first. Peter has come from some particularly interesting backgrounds, right? If you remember back, Peter was the one that rushed, rushed ahead when he should have waited. He's the one that slept when he should have been praying. He's the one that talked when he should have been listening. He's the one who swung the sword when he should have been watching what the Savior was doing. See, this is Peter before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit and dwelt him and changed him completely. Did he believe that Jesus was the Messiah before that? Absolutely he did. He had walked away from his whole life to follow him. But he hadn't been completely changed yet. So while following Jesus and believing in Jesus and allowing his life to be changed in order to do that, there is a transformation that happens in Peter that takes him from being bold, brash, prideful even, Remember a couple of times he's correcting Jesus, telling him he shouldn't do something or shouldn't say something or no, you're not gonna go do that. that. We can't let that happen. That's the bold, brash, prideful Peter. How do we go from there to him being a self-described servant? We go there because God uniquely changed the innermost part of his being. He went from thinking that he had to be the one to do things to knowing that God had already done them all. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces of understanding what it means to walk in a way where we know God and what he's done. We have to be willing to stop and say, all the things I want to do, whether it's for myself or for others, even all the things I want to do for God. God doesn't need me to do those things. He allows me to do those things. He empowers me to do those things. He's glorified, hopefully magnified when we do those things. But he doesn't need me to do those things. You and I can't save anybody. We can't even save ourselves. And Peter had come to that realization because Peter was previously about trying to save everybody, including Jesus. Which if you just really take a step back, that's pretty messed up, okay? So Peter brings a little comic relief to the entire situation by trying to save the Savior, which is interesting. 
But we see his total demeanor, including how he knows God and views him, completely shifted by the time he writes this. Peter knows he's getting to the end of his life, and Peter knows who he is. He is a servant of God. Servant's not a really well-loved term for us, right? But here's the reality of understanding. If we know how God came and served us through Christ and how that particular part of God's character is passed on to us as image bearers, we can understand like Peter did, we're here to serve. We're here to serve. Peter could have used a lot of things to describe himself. There was a lot about Peter. He was a, he was a complicated and interesting guy. He could have used a bunch of different phrases, but what does he use here? He says, I am a servant. I wonder how many of us, myself included, how many of us would really choose to introduce ourselves that way? See, we've talked about this idea of identifying ourselves before and, and how you introduce yourself says a lot about how you see yourself. What would it look like if the people of God honestly introduced themselves by saying, hi, I'm Rob. I'm a servant of God. And what kind of looks would you get? It's a very interesting ones. I'm sure you would. They'd probably be a lot like the looks I get when people find out I'm a pastor. It's a little bit into the conversation and they get the, oh no, what did I say? Did I say something I shouldn't have? But that's, that's part of how we should be perceived in the world, right? It's okay if people want to be different when they're around you. That's okay. It's okay if living for Christ actually makes for some uncomfortable conversations. That's okay. It's okay if you identify yourself as a servant of Christ and people ask, what in the world does that mean? Because then you get to tell them. See, Peter gives us a great example here. He starts off by identifying exactly who he knows he is. He's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He goes on, second part of verse one, to tell us who he's writing to. It's important to know who this letter is written to. It's, we think it's written to a slightly different crowd than the first letter, but the, the people that received the first letter are included in this crowd. It's, this book is a little bit more expanded, we think, in the first century audience. He says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's writing to Christians. There are different portions of scripture that I do believe are written specifically to people who don't know God yet and haven't been redeemed. This isn't one of them. This letter is specifically written to people who have already placed their faith in Christ and have been changed. He says those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, and this is the interesting part, and God is faithful and consistent to always tell us the truth. The people he's writing to did not obtain that faith on their own. They didn't obtain it from being a good person. They didn't obtain it from trying to weigh their good works versus their wrong works. They didn't obtain it by helping people across the street when they need help or carrying a neighbor's groceries in or shoveling somebody's walk. That's not how they obtained this faith that changes them. Look at, look at scripture with me. How did they obtain it? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He does the work. That's how Peter can rightly identify himself as a servant. Because he didn't do it. He knows what God did. He knows that Peter, Peter of all people, knows that he tried to do it by himself. He tried to be more righteous. He tried to be more proactive. 
He tried to be the guy that was going to jump out in front and impress Jesus and others. But in the end, God allowed Peter to be broken so that he would see him rightly. So Peter knows where this faith comes from, and he wants all the readers to know, all the listeners to know exactly where this faith that changes people originates, and it originates with God. The righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our Jesus, and of Jesus, our Lord. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. The first thing Peter gives us here content-wise after he introduces himself and the hearers is the fact that knowing God brings grace and peace. Knowing God brings grace and peace. Again, we stop and realize those two words, we're probably all signing up for that. I would love some grace and I would love peace in my life. I have not met another breathing human being that doesn't want those two things. Now, they might not know how to articulate it all the time. It might not make sense to them when you say you need grace and peace. But if you spend a little time with any living human being and you help them understand what grace is and you help them understand the peace of God, everybody is going to sign up for those. Now, signing up for them does mean the end of yourself. So not everybody wants to do that. But everybody wants grace and peace. Peter accurately identifies for us here where that grace and peace comes from. Grace and peace comes from knowing God. It does not come from having a smoother week next week. It does not come by getting a promotion. It does not come by someone liking you that you like. It does not come by any other standard in this world because we all know the stories, right? Billionaires asked, how much is enough? Just a little bit more. People who are popular and have more likes on social media than anyone else, the same answer. It's never enough. There's always something more. God is the originator and the provider of grace and peace in our lives. When we look to other places, not only are we engaging in idolatry, which we don't like to call it, right? We like to call it distractions or self-interests or other things. But the reality is this. As a Christian, to look anywhere else for fulfillment apart from Christ is idolatry. When we do that, we will not find what we are looking for. What we're looking for is grace and peace. And we won't find it anywhere else. Knowing God brings grace and peace. We're going to refer back to this verse as we go throughout this study in these three chapters of this letter because it's essentially the thesis for all that we're going to look at. Knowing God, the knowledge of God, brings grace and peace to your lives. And the more you know him, the more grace and peace is there. The more you interact with his scriptures, the more you interact with him through prayer and listening, the more you interact with your church family and press each other forward towards knowing him better, the more you get there, the more there is. That's a great thing about the Christian life. You're not going to run out of grace and peace. But the pursuit has to be to know him better all the time. Verse 3. 
The clock in the back says I have three seconds left. That's probably not going to happen. Verse three. Don't worry, we'll carry this one over to next week too. This is the meat. This is a verse that we all need to pause and just look at for a second. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to encourage you to look down. Look at your Bibles. Read the words of verse 3 to yourself while I read them out loud. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Let's read it again. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. All things that pertain to life and godliness. The giver of life brings us all that we need for life. The one who lives perfectly then gives us what it looks like to live godly. How good is God that he's actually given us everything we need? And how broken are we that we keep thinking we need something else? See, this is why Peter can look back and say, I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant. I'm not a headliner. I don't need my name to be remembered. I am a servant of God. Why? Because verse three is true. And Peter knew how much he struggled with it. (laughs) He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And we habitually, continually, repeatedly look elsewhere. And God in his loving mercy says, confess and repent and I will forgive you. How many times? More than you can count. More than you can live. More than you could ever mess up. That's why this verse is so important. If we just stopped here and didn't even go through the rest of this book, this verse would be enough for us as Christians. Because if we really understood that God was giving us everything we needed for life and godliness, we would press in to know him and know that even more every day if we really believe it. And in doing so, we would be able to know when somebody's giving us some heretical belief or somebody's trying to lead us astray doctrinally or teaching something that's opposite of Jesus. Even down to this, and this is something that we need to consider greatly in our day and age today. God tells us in his word that there are three big areas of sin that we need to be aware of and look out for in this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And you know what I am continually amazed at recently? The extent at which we will go to feed our pride. There are major concerns about where our world is existing and living right now, particularly in a day and age where so many of us are connected to people giving us some sort of affirmation. A like, a share. They're starting to consume our world. Why? Because our pride gets fed by them. I've had recent conversations with other pastors and and fellow Christians about this idea of What does it look like to be, I use this term very loosely because I don't think it's a very good one, a famous Christian? You know what it really looks like to be a famous Christian? It looks like you're in trouble. That's what it looks like. The more people that know our name, 
and don't know the name of Jesus well, the more trouble we're gonna be in. That's why this verse is so key. It is his divine power that has granted you everything you need for life and godliness. Not anything else, not anyone else. It's his divine power. And if we start to grasp that or continue to grasp that as we walk with him, we will always be reminded that we're merely servants. We're servants. And servants do what the master asks them to do. And they live under the hand of the master. And thank goodness that we have a good and gracious master that has done everything we need for life and godliness and has retained our salvation for eternity. There's nobody else you should be serving. I mean, for goodness sake, we shouldn't be serving ourselves, right? We all know ourselves well enough to know that. But our broken hearts continue to divert away from truth and towards things that feed our flesh. That's why Peter wrote this second book. The second letter is about knowing who you are and what God's done for you. Deeply, genuinely. To know God is to know his power, his divine power. It's not like any other power any of us have ever experienced. This is divine power that holds the world together just by speaking his words. And thirdly, knowing God's calling brings us to life and godliness. Why? The last phrase. He's granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Where do we get them? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That's where we're supposed to be living in the shadow of his glory, as partakers of his grace. And if we do so, we can live in a world no matter what happens around us. But we need to be careful. And one of the things that Peter shows us throughout this letter is the fact that we need to be alert. Peter was very alert, sometimes too alert. And then sometimes not alert enough when he fell asleep in the garden, right? Other times he's so on edge, he's cutting people's ears off and telling Jesus not to do what Jesus needed to do in order to save him. But here, a redeemed Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives us the right understanding of knowing God and being on the alert for every little thing that will try to pull you in a different direction. Everything. So my prayer is as we go into this series and we spend the next couple of months looking at 2 Peter, that we will be people that will be on the alert. Not just for external pressures, but also for our own brokenness. We'll be on the alert. We'll know. And what do I tend to? What do I... Do I look to, to think I can get life over here apart from God? What is it that I veer away from him on? And in a few minutes, we're going to come to the communion table. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper together and his body broken and his blood spilled. And one of the reasons this is such an important response for us is because we need to be continually reminded that we're broken, but he is perfect. And if we keep our eyes fixed on him, if we press in to know him better, his grace and peace will be multiplied to us. His divine power that grants us everything for life and godliness will be expounded to us. And the only thing that others will see are his glory and excellence, which is the best place to be as a follower of Jesus. Let's pray together and ask the Lord that 
as we not only look at his word this morning, but as we come to his table, that we would be people who know our sin and know our Savior. And as we look to him, that he would continue to draw us in to his glory and excellence so that we would know how much grace and peace he has for us. I'm going to ask you as we do this and as I pray and our, our offering team, our giving team will come and receive this morning's giving. I want to ask you, we're going to sing a song that's new after I pray and as we prepare ourselves for communion. So I'm going to ask you today to stay seated, listen to the words, but also just take a few minutes with the Lord today. How is it that you've been distracted or pulled off course? And what is it that you need to confess and ask for his grace to overwhelm you in that area of life in? Take a couple minutes and do that as we sing this first song and then we will enter into communion together. And then after that, we'll stand and we'll, we'll sing out so that he can be magnified through our lives.